Hey there, everyone. It's Camber here with the Yo Prono. I am so excited to introduce y'all to Stella Ewan, 34 year old university programs lead at Clorox, coming to us live from the Bay Area, all the way out in California. So, Stella, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much. So, as is tradition, I like to start every interview by sharing how we were connected. So, Several of you um, who are listening or watching have definitely definitely know the name Albert. Um, Albert, who from Albert's List, has been an interview on the Oprono once or twice. I think he may have written a blog post, and we've just done a lot of collaboration together. I've been on um, his podcast before and his shows, and so he's just a wonderful person in this career space. And I've been so lucky to to get to know him, and he knows lots of great people. So Stella, you're already great in my book. Um, but we're going to go ahead and just dive right into the interview. So give us a brief overview on who you are, um, you know, how you got to where you are, maybe where you're from, and then we'll dive into those details. So really, you know, high level, how you got to where you are. Sure. And just to clarify, this is from a career context, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started out with my um, undergrad degree in business management, thinking that hey, you know, after I graduate, I'm going to be a manager. Uh, little did I know that, you know, you kind of have to work your way up <laughs> to get to that space to be able to manage anything, whether it's programs, people, whatever that may be. Um, you know, you all know how old I am. So I did graduate during the recession. It was really hard to find a job. So I was talking to my career counselor at the time and she had said, hey, Stella, you know, what will be really cool? Like, you are really good at working with college students. Have you thought of a career in that? And I'm like, no, but obviously she works in that space. So yeah. <laughs> obviously there's a career in that. And I started thinking about it. She gave me a lot of introductions. I did a lot of informational interview. Didn't know I was passionate in it, but um, after all those interviews, I decided, yeah, I was passionate enough to pursue that. So I got my master's in higher education counseling um, and after that, I became a career counselor for a nonprofit working with college students. So that was a really great experience. And um, that was led me to kind of become a career coach on the side as well through my own company called Find Your Peanut Butter. <laughs> yeah, which I yeah. want to talk more about today. Yep, definitely. Um, so with that, you know, I, I really work with uh, young individuals in that space to uh, find jobs and careers that they're happy with. Um, and transitioning from that, I really wanted to work into corporate space. So that's how I got into um, campus recruiting or university recruiting. I've been in that space for about seven years now. Started off as an entry-level campus recruiter, going on campus to recruit for accounting students. Um, since then have transitioned to my position now at the Clorox company but um, really just started from the bottom and worked my way up to manager. Well, and like you said earlier, you realized uh, early on in your career, you do have to make your way up. So um, you paid your dues and obviously it's, it's worked out in your favor. Um, I mentioned before the interview that I always like to ask about retention. And normally I wait a little bit later in the interview, but because you mentioned you've been, um, you know, in this, this space for, or you were in the, um, the higher ed, space, you know, really for seven years. Is that what you said? Yeah. Recruiting. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's not really typical for a lot of young professionals, right. To kind of yep. stay the course. So when you look back at why you do what you do, what has made you stay? That's a really good question. I think it just comes down to what I do and what impact I make. So uh, to this day, I still work with college students Super excited because our summer internship program is right around the corner. I love mentorship. I love programming. Um, part of the summer internship is like putting on programs for uh, the interns, but part of it is I have I get to have fun too. Like I get to be involved in the socials, um, and half my time is just you know talking to people amongst other things. But <laughs> the fun parts is just talking to people and I'm um, really getting to understand them, kind of like what you're doing in this podcast and really helping them along. Um, so that's the impact that I'm trying to make. And um, that's just the work that I love to do. Like, you know, you can ask anyone and they can say, oh my gosh, I don't want to look at a spreadsheet. 
for me, if you talk about spreadsheets and project plans, I'm like, let me see yours. Yeah. You're like, oh gosh, I'm not, we're not the same. Um, no, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. And I think that's really important. It's, it's really about what you are doing. And, you know, I think that's, you don't hear that very often. A lot of times people will tell me that they stay because of, you know, communication or, um, you know, maybe it's the the culture and maybe, maybe part of what you do is, is part of that. But um, I like that answer. So thank you for sharing. So we talked a little bit about higher ed, but tell us about this career coach side hustle that you have. Um, find your peanut butter. Yeah. So this was something that I thought of uh, when I was a career coach. And um, it's funny because when I talk to a lot of my friends who back in the day were dating at the time, you know, I'm just like, well, you know, the recruiting process is really similar. Um, I rather be in the recruiting process than being in the dating process. A lot of people are vice versa. So I started to see a lot of similarities there. I'm like, let me see how I can simplify this for everyone. So Find Your Peanut Butter does have a website and a blog, and it does compare the similarities between finding a soulmate and finding a career. So in the sense that, you know, when you go on a first date, it's like a first interview. When you're um, signing a contract, it's like agreeing to be someone's significant other, for example, <laughs> just to give you some of that um, similarities. But um, that's just how I explain a lot of things to my friends or people who think they don't have the transferable skills, but I'm like, wait, hold on, you do. Mm -hmm. So um, aside from writing for my blog, I do the career coaching on the side. So I provide a lot of services just in terms of getting that one-on-one -on -one coaching, because sometimes reading these articles and blogs, it's like, okay, this is great. This works out, but it's like, what can I do for myself? Like I need, I personally need help. Like I need someone to guide me along. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I really come in again, really understand someone's story and then just uh, coach them from there. And I think there's things about, uh, there's misunderstandings about coaching where I don't tell you what to do, but I lead you right. to make your own decisions. Yeah. You're really like a thinking partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Great. And how many clients do you work with at one time? So since it's my side on the side, I really focus on a couple, like a handful. Um, and that's on purpose just because I want to make sure that I'm available to my clients, um, especially because I do have a full-time day job. Right. Yeah. That, that thing, um, that takes up a little <laughs> bit of time. So very cool. Um, we might get back to that in a little bit, but I want to jump now to one of my favorite questions, which is about challenges and hardships that you've faced. So, um, in your young professional career, so you're 34, um, you know, in the last 10 plus years or so, what have you experienced as a challenge and how have you overcome that? That's a good question. <laughs> one of my favorites, like I said. Yeah, I guess I'll start off with just the past couple of years. Um, I started being a manager right before the pandemic. And I think that transition from individual contributor to manager is actually a really hard transition because I know how to do my day job really well, but no one really teaches you how to be a manager until you're in the role and then you just make a bunch of mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. So along with that um, of being a new manager, then COVID hit. <laughs> so now it's, you know, what do you do with your whole team? What do you do with your programs? What do you do with your, you know, department within the company? And then not only try to figure out managing, but also figuring out COVID and how to evolve everything at the same time. Yeah. So I would say that's been one of the biggest challenges in my career. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm sure it is with most people at this stage, but mm -hmm. the way that I got through it is I just, you know, I'll take a look at big picture, but at the same time, I'll focus on it day by day. Because when there's a lot of unknown, there's only so much you can do. And, um, you know, I, I told people this, I don't strive for perfection. If I'm going to be completely honest, I just do the best I can. Mm -hmm. So if I left today saying, did I do the best I can? And the answer is yes, then I'm okay with that. It doesn't need to be perfect because the next day, something might completely change, which it always does. It always does. <laughs> I don't think I really realized that until recently in my career, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm 26 and 
I've been working in the professional world for five years, but you start, I think around like year four or five, you really do start to have a shift. I don't know if you Mm -hmm. felt that way too. It's like, okay, I've been working for five years now. This is how people act. Um, And it's so, I think your point about managing is so true. No one really teaches you how to manage. And I think that's why so many young professionals do leave because they don't have great management. People can't seem to understand them, um, which is not a good sign of a leader. So what are some things that, aside from, you know, kind of taking it day by day, what are some things that you do that make you a good manager? That's a good question. I would say the first thing is knowing my resources within a company. So knowing that it's not just me having to do everything, even though I do lead my team, but seeing who else is on the greater people team, like um, anyone else in HR, anyone else in the different departments that I can reach out to, Mm -hmm. to help support me and my staff and my team. Um, because I'm not going to know all the answers someone else is going to. So just me even knowing to tap into that and not just relying on myself, I think really helps my team develop. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the other thing is just making mistakes. And the most important thing is owning up to your mistakes. Like I'll sit at a meeting and be like, yeah, that's my bad. Like that's, I admit that's my fault. Like (laughs) I made that mistake versus trying to cover it. Um, because you know, lies grow bigger. It's harder to cover, Yeah, you know, especially as it grows. So, um, I always take that ownership, but then thinking of like, what did I learn from this? So I definitely won't be embarrassed. Um, you know, if I had to do it again, Mm -hmm. making sure like my team doesn't see me make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think those are great. And I can tell that that's, uh, that's a sign of a really good leader. What would you tell people who are listening or watching this interview about being in your specific industry and what they maybe should look out for as far as like skill sets, like maybe they're looking to switch into this kind of industry, or maybe they don't even know this industry um, is even an option for them. What would you tell them? Yeah. So when you say industry, I'm going to focus more on recruiting. Okay. I would say um, people, my assumption is people think that we probably just you know, schmooze a lot, go to networking events, um, just always on the phone, which I mean, we really are. (laughs) Um, At the heart of what we do is about networking and communication, but it's also really about, um, you know, knowing your clients and who you're working with. So my clients are not just the candidates that I recruit, but it's internally as well. Who do I work with? I work with my team. I work with people in payroll. I work with people in the different functions who I recruit for. I work with um, other people in HRs, like the business partners, et cetera, et cetera. So this job requires you to do a lot of communication in the sense that you're constantly needing to give updates, get updates, organize uh, candidates, ensuring candidates have a good experience and looking at it, looking at different things from other people's point of view so you can provide the best service possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough just to get someone through the pipeline, especially with how competitive it is nowadays, but it's taking a look at how can I give everyone the best experience? Mm -hmm. And then to add to that, always looking for ways to improve processes and how to be more efficient and how to stay ahead of the curve Mm -hmm. um, because we just need to do that to stay on top of things. Yeah, great. Um, and as we wrap things up, because I'm mindful of time, what are some last minute words of advice that you have to share with this audience? Um, maybe something we haven't covered that you wanted to cover or just last minute words. I would say, just say, don't think you have to have it figured out. Uh, for me, I, (laughs) when I was younger, I did have like a five, 10 year plan. Now that I'm older and, you know, I met my goal of becoming a manager I honestly don't know what's next. And that doesn't really scare me because I'll just figure it out. Yeah. Um, like the one job that you hold outside of school or grad school, whatever it is, isn't going to be your final job. Just play the field and see where it lands you. It could be something completely different or it could just go up the, you, you move up the ladder, mm-hmm. whatever it is, just be open to different opportunities and don't think too much into it. You know, have a plan, have some goals, but like, don't think you, have to meet it exactly. Yeah. Oh, I love to hear that. My gosh. Amen to that. We, uh, (laughs) we need to like 
put that on, uh, you know, a coaster or something. Um, <laughs> no, that really is, that's really why this whole thing started. It's why Yo Pro started in the first place, because you're not supposed to love your first job. You are taught that you should love it. But when you get into it, you think everything has to be perfect. It really doesn't. Um, and so I love that you just said, I don't know what's next, but I'm not really worried about it. That's, that's huge. Um, so I think it's a great way to end the interview. Um, Stella, how can people find you? Yeah, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, uh, but you can also find me on my website, um, findyourpeanutbutter.com or feel free to email me at Stella at findyourpeanutbutter.com. Awesome. And we will link all of those things um, in your, in the comments on your story, but Stella, thanks so much for being a part of the Oprah. I'm so happy to, uh, to have met you and have you on the show. Thank you so much.